We're going to preach tonight on the subject of the Calvinism debate. And who is the enemy? In Revelation 22, verse 17, and the Bible says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The Calvinism debate. What a hot debate this is, and it's an ongoing debate. It's been ongoing for several hundred years. Let's go to the Lord tonight in prayer and ask Him to help us as we preach this message tonight. Father, we thank You for the Word of God tonight. We thank You for the great and precious knowledge we have that Jesus died on the cross, Lord, to make it possible for us to be saved. I pray, Lord, You give us understanding and wisdom tonight. I pray it will be something to help somebody, Lord, in this, uh, in this discussion, this debate, this controversy, Lord, that still rages today. I pray it will be something, Lord, that you can bless and be helpful to your people. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible here in Revelation plainly says, whosoever will. Let him come and take the water of life freely. And we know that it's talking about salvation. And yet there are those who believe that Jesus did not die for every person. That Jesus only died for a certain chosen few. And that no one can be saved except those chosen few. That before we're even born... God decided whether we're going to be saved or not, whether we're going to be elect or not, and there's nothing we can do to change that. I have some things to say by way of introduction tonight that I believe are very important. Number one, Baptists must face this issue as much as we might like to avoid it. And it's been an issue that has divided Baptist churches for hundreds of years. Recently, we finished uh, scanning and preparing a, another Baptist history to put on our ne- next edition of the CD-ROM. And it was a Baptist history written in 1818 by a man named Adam Taylor, History of the General Baptist of England. Two volumes. And it's the only history of the Baptists that was written by a man who was not a Calvinist. Most of the histories, all of them to my knowledge, are written by Calvinists, and they don't even usually hardly mention that there were other kinds of Baptists, but there were, and there were many of them, and they were called general Baptists, which means they believed in a general atonement. They believed that Jesus died to make it possible for every person to be saved. And and they've always been divided on this. In fact, in that church history... It was interesting to see that in those days, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, they took this issue so seriously that they would not receive baptisms from one of the other churches. And if somebody came from one of the Calvinist churches, they would not receive his baptism. They rebaptized him. Because they believed that, that that doctrine of particular atonement was so false that it was a different gospel. Be that as it may... Baptists must face this issue and have always had some divisions along these lines. Secondly, by way of introduction tonight, I am convinced that John Calvin has caused great harm among God's people because of his errors. And few things have hindered biblical evangelism more than Calvinism. That's a fact. Calvinism almost killed the Baptist churches of England in the early 18 uh, and 19th centuries. Almost killed them. It was Calvinism, single-handedly. When God spoke to the heart of William Carey and stirred his heart that the gospel needed to be preached to, to India and to other parts of the world, and he was a letter, he was a shoemaker. And he made himself a little leather globe of the world so he could meditate upon that need to carry the gospel to people who had never heard. Well, he got up in a meeting 
and he proposed in that meeting of Baptist churches, I think we need to discuss whether we have a duty to carry the gospel to the heathen. Well, the director of that of those churches stood up, sprang to his feet, and he ordered William Carey to sit down, and he said, when God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. And that's what Calvinism had done to the churches of that day. Very great error. But number three, in introduction tonight, is by way of introduction, the errors of Calvinism are the fault of Calvin himself, not merely the abuse of those that had followed him. Some have the idea that, well, Calvin himself was pretty straight. It's those Calvinists that have come after him that have really uh, uh, made the doctrine unscriptural. But my friends, that's not true. In preparation... For the first time I preached this message, which was at Heritage Baptist University in Indiana, I read Calvin's Institutes. It's two volumes. This is one. This is the second volume. Calvin's Institutes. This is where Calvinism comes from. It was boring reading. I don't recommend you try to do that. But it was Calvin himself that came up with these strange doctrines. It was Calvin himself that believed in a sovereign and unconditional reprobation. It means that God has chosen some people to go to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. Can you imagine that? That before you were born, God decided you were going to hell or at least he decided he wasn't going to elect you and therefore you are going to hell. And there's not a thing in the world you can do about it. Can you imagine the, the, the incredible influence that that doctrine would have in the minds of people if they really believed that? Well, you might as well live like you please. You might as well blow your brains out. There's nothing you can do to change your destiny. That's a lie. But this is what Calvin said. God devotes to destruction whom he pleases. They are predestinated to eternal death by his sovereign will. He orders all things by his counsel and decree in such a manner that some men are born devoted from the womb to certain death, that his name be glorified in their destruction. God chooses whom he will as his children. He rejects and reprobates others. So it was Calvin himself that believed in sovereign reprobation. It was Calvin himself who denounced the universal offer of the gospel. He said, it's wrong. You shouldn't go around just say, telling everybody they can be saved. It's wrong, he said. Calvin said that. In book 3, chapter 22 of his work, he said, when it appears that when the doctrine of salvation is offered to all for their effectual benefit... It is a corrupt prostitution of that which is declared to be reserved particularly for the children of the church. He said it's wrong to be going around preaching the gospel to everybody. Telling everybody that God loves them. He said God doesn't love everybody. Calvin taught that. Calvin, not only that, taught that God had preordained Adam's fall. God's the author of sin with this system. This is what Calvin said. God not only foresaw the fall of the first man and the ruin of his posterity in him, but arranged by the determination of his will. That's an indictment of God, God's character there. This whole thing is. This sounds very much like a different God than I find in the Bible. But that was Calvin's doctrine. It wasn't just somebody that came along after him. Number four, by way of introduction. Calvinism is an unsettled theology. If you talk to different Calvinists, they'll say, well, no, I don't believe exactly like that. My Calvinism's a little different. And they all want to modify it a little bit. But, and that reminds us that this is not really a settled theology. There is an acronym called TULIP to define the points of Calvinism. 
And uh, that is T, total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, and P, the perseverance of the saints, tulip theology. But within that, you've got all sorts of divisions, and you've got people that say, well, I'm only a four-point Calvinist, I'm a three-point Calvinist, I'm a this and that. And each Calvinist believes he has the freedom and the liberty to modify Calvinism. Well, let me remind every Calvinist tonight that if you have the liberty to modify Calvinism, I have the liberty to reject the whole thing. And I do. But let me say lastly tonight, is by way of introduction, number five, that God does not require His people to choose between Calvinism and Arminianism. This is the choice they always want to force upon people. Oh, well, that means you're an Arminian. Huh? You're not a Calvinist. No, it doesn't mean anything like that. It means I'm just trying to follow the Bible. The Bible says, Prove all things, hold fast, that which is good. The test and the authority is this book, not what some man has devised in his system of theology, no matter who it is. And so we don't have to choose. James White wrote to me once, and he challenged me to a debate, and he said, you, you debate with me, and you defend Arminianism. And I wrote back and said, I don't believe Arminianism. Why would I want to defend it? But that's the either-or thing there. That's, well, you're not a Calvinist, so that means you're an Arminian. It means no such thing. And it was Calvin himself that started that idea. Those that disagreed with him, he treated them as if they were enemies of God. You see, I can reject something a man says and not be an enemy of God. As long as I am faithful to this book that God has given. And yet, those that disagreed with Calvin was something about him that caused him to treat them as great enemies of God himself. Calvin very much had that idea. And, uh, and yet, we don't, we're not forced into that today. We can, we can measure Calvin with this book. We can reject Calvin, if need be and not be the enemies of God, and not be Arminians. And so we come to the heart of the message tonight, and that is the central errors of Calvinism. The central errors of Calvinism. And that is, number one, turning theology into a philosophy. That's what Calvinism does. It turns theology into a philosophy. What's the difference? Well, philosophy is man trying to make sense out of life and explain all of its mysteries through human reasoning and, and, and make everything fit together like a puzzle. Whereas theology, this is how I would define theology, is believing and teaching the Bible. Period. That's all there is to it. If it makes sense or doesn't make sense. And we can get into trouble by, by trying to make everything fit together so perfectly because we don't have the ability in this present world to make it all fit together. All we can do is simply believe what God has revealed. And we try to understand it, but when we try to just make it all fit together like a glove, we start getting into trouble and we start being philosophers rather than theologians. In fact, the Bible warns about philosophy. Look at Colossians 2, verse 8. Colossians 2, verse 8. The Bible warns about leaving the simplicity of Christ. Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And so we're warned here that men are going to try to, to spoil us and to lead us astray, and we have to be careful. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, the Bible also warns about this. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so the Bible is warning here about this. 
and warning that the things of Christ are simple so that we can understand them. And if we go beyond that simplicity, we get, a, get ourselves in trouble. I believe that's exactly what Calvin has done. He was a very brilliant man, of course. He is praised and revered in terms you would think almost people are talking about the Lord. And yet he was only a man. And I want to illustrate what I'm talking about in the Bible. Look at Acts 13, verse 48. Acts 13, verse 48. Acts 13, verse 48, turning theology into philosophy. Acts 13, 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the Calvinist says, see there? They were saved because they were chosen. See there? Well, yeah, in that verse. But look at two verses down. I'm sorry, two verses before that in Acts 13, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And putting these two verses together, you don't have Calvinism at all. The reason they did not get saved in verse 46 is not because they were not chosen to be saved, but because they rejected the Word of God. Words could not be plainer. And therefore, whatever verse 48 means in regard to coordination, it cannot mean all of the things that Calvin says it means. What is that? That's just believing the Bible. Not trying to make a, a, a deep system out of it all. Not trying to reconcile everything because we can't. There seems to be a contradiction between verse 44, 46, and 48. We know there's not, but there seems to be because of our little understanding and the fact that we live in this present world. And we do not see things from the light of eternity and all of that and the small capacity of our minds in this present situation we're in. But theology would just believe that. But, but philosophy is going to try to reconcile it and put it all together and make perfect sense out of all of it. Look with me at another passage. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. And these are the passages that I show to people when they ask me, what am I, Calvinist or Arminian? I say, neither one. I just believe all of these things. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, and that they all might be damned who believed not to truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Well, if we would only read verse 13, it would look like God just completely chooses who will be saved and who will be lost. And yet when we look at verses 10 through 12, we see that that's not the case at all because those that are lost are lost because of something they do, which is they do not receive the truth. You say, well, I don't understand all that. Nobody does. But that's what the Bible says. And Charles Spurgeon, who was a Calvinist, described this matter very, very plainly in his writings. For example, in 1858, he says, God, that God predestines and that man is responsible are two things that few can see. 
They are believed to be inconsistent and contradictory, but they're not. It is just the fault of our weak judgment. Two truths cannot be contradictory to each other. If then I find taught in one place that everything is foreordained, that is true. If I find in another place that man is responsible for all his actions, that is true. And it is my folly that leads me to imagine that two truths can ever contradict each other. These two truths I do not believe ever can ever be wielded into one upon any human anvil, but one they shall be in eternity. They are two lines that are so nearly parallel that the mind that shall pursue them farthest will never discover that they converge, but they do converge, and they will meet together somewhere in eternity close to the throne of God from whence all truth does spring. And that's true. And Calvinism is, turns theology into philosophy, and what we need to be very careful to do in our lives is just believe the Bible. Systematic theology has its place, I believe, but it's dangerous because it is simply man trying to reconcile things in the Bible. And we just need to stand upon the Word of God and believe what it says and not go much further than that. But there's a second error of Calvinism. And that is that its conclusions are contrary to plain Scripture. Its conclusions are contrary to plain Scripture. For example, Calvinism, the T-U-L-I-P, the I, is irresistible grace which means that when God, wants, when God has chosen you to be saved, He will irresistibly draw you to salvation and you will be saved. There's nothing you can do about it. Irresistible grace. Is that what the Bible says? Not hardly. We can go back to the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis. Cain resisted the grace of God. Genesis 4, verse 6 and 7. God said, hey, Cain, you don't need to be angry. You're not doing right. Cain rejected him. God pleaded with him. The world before the flood resisted the grace of God. God rose Moses and Noah up to preach to them, that generation. He preached for 120 years. And yet they resisted and they went to hell. Israel of old resisted the grace of God in Romans 10 verse 21. But he saith all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And the strong Calvinist wants to say, but your, your God is so weak, he can't save people. No, it's that he has sovereignly chose that man have a will. And it's an awful truth, but man can reject God. God made it that way. That was God's sovereign choice to make man that way. It's not because God's weak. It's because of His plan. Israel of Christ, they rejected the grace of God. Jesus was there Himself doing miracles. And yet most of them rejected Him. And He came and He wept over Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 37. And He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. He said, I would. But he says at the end, ye would not. Ye would not. God would. They would not. There's no irresistible grace in the Bible. In John 5, 40, Jesus said, And ye will not come to me, that you might have life. Ye will not, he said. He didn't say you cannot come because the Father didn't draw you. He said, you will not. You will not. The Jews of Paul's day rejected the grace of God. The Jews of Paul's day, Paul could do miracles too. Great miracles. And yet those Jews rejected those miracles. And in Acts 13, 46, Paul said, Seeing ye have put it away from you, and judge yourselves unworthy. He didn't say they were not part of the elect. He said, it's your fault. If you die and go to hell, it's your fault. You've rejected the gospel. 
And the unsaved during the days of Antichrist will reject the grace of God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, the passage we read, uh, the Bible says, Because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, that's why they'll be deceived. Not because they're not part of the elect. And there's no such thing in the Bible as irresistible grace and the conclusions of Calvinism are contrary to the plain teaching of the Scripture. To me, it's an easy choice. Well, what is it? And then you've got the doctrine of limited atonement. T-U-L, L, limited atonement. In, in other words, that Jesus' death on the cross was limited in its effect only for those who would be saved for the elect. Is that what the Bible says? Not hardly. John 3, 16, God loves all men. 2 Peter 3, 9, God desires all men to be saved. John 6, 51, Jesus gave his flesh for the life of the world. 1 Timothy 2, 6, Jesus was a ransom for all men. Hebrews 2, 9, Jesus tasted death for all men. 1 John 2, 2, Jesus provided propitiation for all men. 2 Peter 2, 1, Jesus bought and paid for even unsaved false teachers. It says they deny the Lord that bought them, but they're not saved. Isaiah 53, 6, the iniquity of all men was laid upon Jesus. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way. Every one to his own way. Now that's universal sin. We know that. Well, the last part of the verse says, And he hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Well, if the first part of the verse is universal sin, the second part of the verse is a universal provision for salvation. And it is. And as is, has been said before, all means all, and that's all it means. And the Bible plainly says, that Jesus died for all men. And if a man goes to hell, it's not the fault of Jesus Christ. It's not the fault of God the Father. It's his own. You say, well, not everybody's heard. No, but there's light. There's bright, brilliant light in this world. There's the light of creation, and every man can see it. We've talked to people in Nepal, Hindus that lived out in villages, and uh, talked to them after they got saved, and they've told us how that when they were growing up, they would look at the majestic Himalaya mountains, and they would look at the stars, and they would look at themselves, and they would know that it, it, it couldn't, God couldn't be an idol. But they didn't know who God was, but they knew He wasn't that. And God speaks to people through the light of creation and the light of conscience which is that inside of us telling us that there is a God and telling us that we are sinners and speaking to us, God speaks to us through the conscience. The Bible says Jesus Christ, John 1, 12, is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Why would he do that if salvation was only for a few? Why would he lighten them? That would be cruel. Well, he lightens him because salvation is for every man, but man has to respond. And God draws him, and if a man will respond to the light he has, God will send him more light. We see that in the case of Cornelius. And men are condemned already. Men are not condemned when they die. They're condemned already because of the sin. That's what the Bible plainly says in the Gospel of John. And so Calvinism, its conclusions are contrary to the plain Scripture. Plain Scripture, there's an error number three that I want to deal with tonight. And that is Calvinism isolates Scriptures and interprets Scripture by theology rather than by context. This is very important. How can I understand the Bible? Well, one thing you've got to learn to do, one thing we have to learn to do is we have to learn to interpret the Bible by its context and not isolate any one scripture out of its context. 
That's the way we understand the words of the Bible. You cannot put a definition on a Bible word and then make that fit every context. It won't do it. You read the context and allow the context to determine the definition and the meaning of the passage. And yet that's not what Calvinism does. Look with me at John 6, verse 44. John 6, verse 44. Actually, we've already seen some examples of this. But in John 6, 44 is another one commonly used by Calvinists. John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And they say, see there, you can't be saved unless the Father draws you. Okay, fine. But look at John 12, 32. John 12, 32. In John 12, 32, which is in the same Gospel of John as the other passage, Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, and what's that? The cross. I will draw all men unto me. I will draw all men unto me. So here he said he would draw all men. John 1, 12, he's the light that lights every man. And so we don't isolate John 6, 44 and build some theology by that verse standing alone. We build our theology by comparing Scripture with Scripture and we realize that Calvinism can't be right because it only deals with some Scriptures and tries to explain away the others. For example, 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 6. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 through 6. One of the most important passages on the atonement. Um, <clears throat> and what Jesus did when he died on the cross. 1 Timothy 2, verse Three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. It's very plain here that Jesus died for everybody. That God wants everybody to be saved. That is so plain. Words could not be plainer. And yet, the Calvinist will come along and try to explain this to fit his theology and somehow uh, 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 make it say what it doesn't say. I like what old Spurgeon said about this here in his commentary. Listen to what he said. This is very important. What then? Shall we try to put another meaning into a text than that which it fairly bears? I trow not. You must, most of you, be acquainted with the general method in which our older Calvinist friends deal with this text. All men, they say, that is, some men. As if the Holy Ghost could not have said some men if he had meant some men. All men, they say, that is, some of all sorts of men. As if the Lord could not have said all sorts of men if he had meant that. The Holy Ghost, by the Apostle, has written, All men. And unquestionably, he means all men. I was reading just now the exposition of a very able doctor who explains the text so as to explain it away. He apply, applies grammatical gunpowder to it and explodes it by way of his expounding it. My love of consistency with my own doctrinal views is not great enough to allow me knowingly to alter a single text of Scripture. That's good. That's what set Spurgeon apart from the other Calvinists of that day. I have great respect for orthodoxy, he said, but my reverence for inspiration is far greater. I would sooner a hundred times over appear to be inconsistent with myself than be inconsistent with the Word of God. I believe that. And they isolate Scripture and interpret Scripture by theology rather than context. That's extremely dangerous. They assign set definitions to theological terms 
rather than allowing the context to define our theological terms. Like the, the, the term election. Perfectly good Bible word. A Calvinist wrote to me the other day. He said, do you believe in election? I wrote back and said, I believe everything the Bible says about election. Almost nothing Calvin said about it. But everything the Bible says. And I'm not going to try to force somebody's theology on the Bible. There's another error. And la these last two we just kind of mentioned. But Calvinism confuses the church with Israel. That's one of its chief errors. The church is not Israel. And yet Calvin's major argument for unconditional election and reprobation is, of course, based on Romans chapter 10, which is about Israel. When God said He chose one and He hated the other, He's talking about Israel and Israel's election as a nation for God's plan and program, he was not talking about personal salvation at all. The context could not be plainer. In fact, God's sovereign election spoken of in Romans chapter 10 and 9, Romans chapter 9, I'm sorry, God's sovereign election and rejection of Esau and election of Jacob is contrasted with the personal salvation of Romans 10. You understand what I'm saying? In Romans 9, the Bible says God chooses whom He will and raises up whom He will and rejects whom He will. He's talking about His election as a nation of Israel. But Romans 10 is plainly talking about personal salvation and Romans 10 tells us how that comes about. How's that? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. That's how that comes about. And Romans 10 is not talking about the same thing in the first part of the verse as Romans 9 was talking about. And again, it's a confusion of context and refusing to allow the context to just decide these things for us and pulling things out of context and confusing Israel with the church. There's a lot that could be said about that. But let me move to the fifth error tonight, the last error that I want to mention, and that is Calvin went back to the church fathers instead of going all the way back to the apostles. If you'll read books about history and theology, you'll hear, you'll read a lot about the church fathers. Who are they? Well, they're just church leaders of old days, and a lot of them were heretics. A lot of them were the fathers of the Catholic Church. And one of those old heretics was Augustine. He was one of the fathers of the Catholic Church, and yet he's exalted by Protestants, because, you see, Protestants never were far enough away from Rome. And they didn't go all the way back to the Apostolic Church. They just went part of the way back, back to the fathers. Well, the real fathers are the apostles. The ones we're to follow are the apostles, not somebody in the 3rd or 4th century that has already, already corrupted himself. And yet Calvin admits that his authority was, was Augustine. In fact, this is what he says. If I were inclined to compile a whole volume from Augustine, I could easily show my readers that I need no words but his. He's admitting that Augustine was where he got his ideas about election and reprobation. And many, 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 many times in his books, he, he says, let Augustine answer for me, and he quotes the man. Well, Augustine was a heretic. And we don't go back to some so-called church fathers. We go back to the Bible. We go all the way back to the beginning. The churches that were established by the apostles, that, those are the churches that God intended us to follow until Jesus comes back. And so the errors of Calvinism, there are many, and I've just touched a few, but I believe these get at the heart of the error. And let me conclude tonight by asking the question, well, who is the enemy then in this debate? Who's the real enemy? And I believe this is very important for us to consider, and I have two simple points. Number one, any theology that dampens evangelistic and missionary zeal is an enemy. 
In the Bible, it's very plain that God's people are supposed to have a zeal to reach the lost. We are not supposed to sit around. And if you are sitting around month after month and year after year and you claim to be a child of God and you're not earnestly trying to reach the lost, and there are many ways to do that, you are wrong. And you will be very sad at the judgment seat of Christ because the main plan and program and burden of Almighty God and Jesus Christ tonight is that we reach the lost with the gospel. They will die and go to hell. And it's not because God chose them to die and go to hell. It's because they die without the gospel. And God's people are a big part of that plan and program. We see that in Christ. That's why He came. That's why He died. That's why He rose from the dead. That's the great commandment that He gave. That's what we see in the lives of the apostles. They took that command seriously and they went out and they gave their lives to the reaching of the lost with the gospel. The Bible says they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. And any theology that dampens that zeal is damnable theology. And yet we've already seen that at different points in history, Calvinism has destroyed that zeal and given God's people the idea that they don't need to go reach the lost, that if God's chosen them, they'll be saved and irresistibly drawn, and somehow they will be saved, but the Bible doesn't say any such thing. But even in Spurgeon's day, it was that way. Spurgeon was a very famous preacher in the 1800s, and he Baptist pastored the huge Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. Never had an empty seat. Started pastoring, I believe, when he was 18. And the man never preached to an empty seat. I don't know anybody that could ever say that in church history. He was an amazing man. An incredible preacher. And yet... In Spurgeon's day, Spurgeon was hated, even though he called himself a Calvinist. He was hated by the Calvinists because he preached that sinners should come to Christ and can come to Christ, and he preached the gospel to all sinners. And he gave a universal invitation and invited men to come to Christ. And therefore, the Calvinists of that day preached against Spurgeon, wrote about him in their papers. One of the old Calvinists of that day, Baptist. In the paper, The Earthen Vessel of 1857 said, To preach that it is man's duty to believe savingly in Christ is absurd. Oh, it's absurd by their theology, but it's not absurd according to the Bible. It is man's responsibility to believe on Christ. And in that day, there were most of the Calvinists had destroyed evangelism, had destroyed missions. And yet Spurgeon took a different path because really he was just a Bible believer. He did claim to be a Calvinist, but we've seen from his own writings that at heart he was just a Bible believer. And he refused to twist the Scriptures around when it did not fit its theology. And he knew that God wanted him to preach the gospel, and he did. A very important book, Spurgeon versus the Hyper-Calvinist, The Battle for Gospel Preaching. And any theology that hinders and dampens evangelistic zeal is wrong. Even in our day, there are some Calvinists that are very zealous for souls. There are some Calvinists that are more zealous for souls than some that don't believe in Calvinism. And the Metropolitan Tabernacle is one of those examples. The church that Spurgeon pastored is still there today, although much smaller in London. And they preach and they have a Sunday school on Sunday afternoon and they go out across London and they have thousands of people in their Sunday school. And they go out and preach on the streets. And they preach the gospel. And uh, and, uh, and the, the Word of God tells us that any theology that dampens evangelistic zeal, that is the enemy. And I believe there's something even more dangerous than a soul winning Calvinist. And that is any methodology that corrupts evangelistic zeal is the enemy. I personally feel closer to some Calvinists, soul winning Calvinists, 
than I do to some independent Baptists with their man-centered theology and practice and what I call quick prayerism. What's that, you say? Well, it's quick to lead people in a prayer even when there's no evidence of conviction. Without the Spirit of God, you can't save anybody. If the Spirit of God is not bringing that conviction and that repentance and that re- uh, uh, enlightenment, then you're not going to save them by getting them to pray a prayer. And not only that, you're going to give them a vain hope. A quick to ignore repentance or redefine repentance so that it has nothing to do with the changed life. But repentance always has something to do with the changed life. I don't save myself by changing my life, but when I really get saved, my life will change. And anybody that comes along and indicates that a bunch of people can get saved and there not be any difference, something's wrong with their theology. Quick to give people assurance even if there's no evidence of salvation. I believe it's very dangerous to run around giving people assurance just because they prayed some prayer or went through a religious ritual. A prayer is just a religious ritual. And to go along and say, well, now you've prayed that prayer. What, what, what does God think about you now? Where are you going when you die? You don't know where he's going when he dies. You don't know what he did in his heart. You don't know if he repented and put his faith in Christ. All you know is that he prayed a prayer. And a person can pray sincerely in repentance and faith and get saved. And a person can also pray and not get saved because repentance and faith is not in their heart. And to run around giving people assurance when they're not saved is a very dangerous thing. It's quick also to count numbers regardless of how empty they are. I think of a man in a big city and no, it's not near Chicago. And he claims that since he's been in this church 25, 26 years, 100,000 people have been saved there. But his church is no bigger than it was when he started. Something's wrong. If 100,000 people were saved, that whole city would have been turned around. No, they haven't been saved, but 100,000 people prayed some prayer, went through some religious ritual. And any methodology that corrupts evangelistic zeal is just as deadly and just as wrong as a Uh, theology that dampens evangelistic zeal. Let me conclude tonight. I'm not saying that some forms of Calvinism are scriptural. By my mention of Spurgeon, and I'm not saying that. I don't believe any form of Calvinism is scriptural. I don't accept any Calvinism. Spurgeon said we need to go back to the Calvinism of John Calvin. I disagree strongly with that. No, we need to go all the way back to the Bible. Forget Calvin, just forget Calvin. He was a great persecutor of of God's people, hated Baptists with a passion. Forget Calvin, just go straight back to the Bible. And let me say also in conclusion tonight, Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst Come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. My friends, that means exactly what it says. Salvation is offered to all. Salvation is available to all. We need to be busy. We need to reject Calvinism. But we need to be busy preaching the great truths of the Word of God that tell us that Jesus died for every man and that God offers salvation to every man. Whosoever will, let him come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the Word of God and the light that it is upon our dark world and confusion of Christianity. We pray that, Lord, you'd bless this message as it goes out on the video, Lord. We pray that you'd encourage and help people with it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.